Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah Kempton. I'm the National Vice President with the Australian Institute of National Affairs. And I'd like to welcome you all here today to the Forum on, Foreign, on Ministers for Foreign Affairs uh, from 1972 to 1983. The nine-year focus, a period in focus, is divided into that of the Whitlam era, Whitlam government from 1972 to 1975, with Foreign Ministers Gough Whitlam and Don Willesey, and the Fraser government from 1975 to 1983, with Foreign Ministers Andrew Peacock and Tony Street. I said in my introduction three years ago that I'd recently read that the only thing more dangerous than forgetting history is to misremember it. Certainly, Fraser made his mark uh, in 1976 with his dramatic State of the World statement. Let me then sum up. The short but turbulent tenure of the Whitlam government was undoubtedly a major episode in Australian foreign policy, changing the nature and direction of the policy and the attendant public debate about it. But it was, I think, both a strength and a weakness that Whitlam kept such a tight personal hold on the area. His grand visions were often well aimed, but his legacy was marred by his insistence that he, and only he, should control both the long-term direction and the short-term implementation. Senator Don Willesey did not have equivalent vision, but he had sound political instincts and a sense of decency that were complementary to Whitlam's qualities. If they'd formed a more effective partnership, the foreign policy legacy of the Whitlam years might well have proved less ambiguous, more enduring and more substantive. I'll just now conclude in making some general points on the era of Peacock and Street. I see it as very much a period of bipartisan, bipartisanship in foreign policy. After the dramatic developments of the period from 1972 to 75, Peacock and Street presided over a period of bipartisan consensus on the most important elements of foreign policy. But I would like to highlight a couple of themes that I think come out of what I'm going to say. Um, and that remain uh, as true today, perhaps, as they were in, at the time that we're talking about. And one is that in, um, uh, in, in our relations with China at this period, we see a continuing, one continuing theme, that is what weight we give to human rights issues. And, and another theme is uh, what is the nexus between trade and diplomacy. The, uh, the third one, and perhaps the overriding one, is what weight do we give our regional relationships with countries in the uh, near neighbours in, in Asia and our traditional alliances? Uh, I was in Tokyo in 1971 when Gough Whitman came through on his way back from China and met Japanese political leaders. One of the institutions that was set up uh, from 1972 on in terms of Australia-Japan relations was the Australia-Japan Ministerial Committee mechanism, which was uh, became a focus for uh, the, the overall management of Australia-Japan relations. Eve, 1975, the American Embassy in Canberra dispatched to Washington its first substantial assessment of the new Fraser government. The tone was hopeful, positive, relieved. Um, that letter uh, paints a fairly bleak picture about um, Vietnam becoming a major threat to the region. Uh, I want to talk about disruption because I've been given the brief of talking about Indonesia. And, of course, if we talk about policy towards Indonesia, the issue that looms largest is the East Timor issue. While hypothetical outcomes are a little, a little more than speculation, there are some grounds for the conjecture that had Whitlam been a little less devoted to the largest principles and more concerned with local outcomes, his policy in relation to Indonesia might have produced a more felicitous result. And so thus we have this sad coda. There's his book, Pacific Community, published in 1981, all about Australia's regional mission. There's nothing in there about Indonesia. 
And yet this is the country that he says repeatedly, our fates are inextricably entwined. He's quite unable to say anything about Indonesia because the record is so dark. Um, the third world countries were focused on two broad aspects of international policy. One goal was to facilitate the decolonisation of those remaining colonial territories on the basis of national self-determination. This goal extended to ending apartheid in South Africa and white minority rule in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. Another I was at the front line of policy change when posted to South Africa in 1974. Under Conservative governments, white South Africans had been used to a very different relationship with Australia. They saw Australians as like us, and as friends in South Africa's increasingly bitter battle with the international community. They were angry and perplexed at Australia's newly hostile policy stance under the Whitlam government, both in bilateral relations, especially Australian sporting sanctions, and international forums. Fortunately, you have a, a special prologue to give uh, on behalf of Melissa, who just today received a letter from Tony Street, who's one of the people we've been talking about. Um, in the embassy in East Germany, where he was the one who, his, his government, uh, recognized the new state of, uh, of East Germany, um, leading the pack, I have to say. We were one of the first Western nations to do so. Um, but it was interesting because the Fraser cabinet at that time, it wasn't dominated by Andrew Peacock. Uh, I sit in on the cabinet meeting quite a few times accompanying Doug Anthony and the cabinet was dominated by Fraser, Anthony, Sinclair, Nixon and then John Howard. So the, the foreign minister was didn't quite have the importance that he would normally have in a cabinet at that time. Um, I wanted to say two things about diplomacy um, under uh, uh, Whitlam and Fraser which I don't think have come through sufficiently uh, yet in one broader thing about uh, um, foreign policy. Um, <coughs> first thing about diplomacy, in a personal sense, I think it, it is very hard now to underestimate the enormous effect of the arrival of the social changes of the 1960s on Australian diplomacy uh, when, uh, when Whitlam uh, arrived. Uh, Pinchin was always, having been there, it was always difficult to understand uh, how Australian politicians understood it because each of them, in their own way, had had some experience in PNG. But the other thing was, I'd just like to mention this, is another name hasn't come up at all. And I think he was probably more instrumental in managing Malcolm's policies than anyone we talked about, namely Alan Griffith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fatty Griffith. And Gough was impressive about his intentions in foreign policy and his knowledge of Indonesia and his intention to restore the glory days of the 1940s and to involve people like Kirby and Critchley in that sort of thing. Now after the seven years of humiliation all the way with LBJ... No, I'm you know, East Timor which I started to talk about because of uh, my continuous involvement being in Jakarta from 75 to 78. Uh, it wasn't the easiest time, as you could imagine. Um, but things were, I think, rather better than you would probably realise. Um, uh, on behalf of all those who've been listeners rather than speakers in the room, um, I'd like to thank those who've been the speakers from the bottom of my heart. And I'm, I'm using that language so that I can include all those who stood up and given an anecdotes and reminiscences and everything rather than you know, restricting it to those who've given us formal speeches. It's really been uh, a privilege to be here amongst so many great names. Um, the result, I'm hoping, will be uh, another book um, on Australian foreign ministers uh, based on the set papers delivered by uh, uh, a number of you. Um, but also, uh, once again, mining the, uh, the rich load uh, of uh, anecdotes based on experience from uh, from those uh, of you who were in the question and answer sessions after each uh, speaker, as well as uh, the final session uh, today. Uh, and so um, that brings the day to a close, or in other words, la commedia es finita. <laughs>